Welcome to Foxo's Black Report. This is the place where we bring you the headlines and the latest in black news, views, and opinions. I'm Brooke. I'm Romeo. I'm Demi. And I'm Melissa. Tommy Bennett, the president of a Danville NAACP, will join us to discuss monopoly inclusion and UCLA professor Walter Allen is here to discuss diversity and inclusion in higher learning institutions. The CDC releases a new COVID-19 study, Disney World employees, employees harassed due to COVID-19 restrictions, and the mayor of Detroit rejects, rejects a COVID-19 vaccine. LeBron James defends voting rights. The NBA All-Star Weekend plans to celebrate HBCUs. A woman snaps over a popular 80s tune and Chick-fil-A makes an important announcement. Yes, we have all of that and so much more. So if you're ready, it's our voice and our truth. Let's get it. To me, this reeks of conflict of interest. Do we know if he actually waved a gun? We only hear one side of the story. This just really did make me feel good that the justice system did what they needed. But we're gonna keep following this story and we will have the latest food. All right, here are your headlines for the day. The Marine Corps is promoting Colonel Anthony Henderson to Brigadier General. Henderson is a combat-tested Iraq and Afghanistan veteran. And this promotion is a move that cracks the doorway for the service to potentially promote a black man to its most senior ranks. The New York Times is reporting the Marine Corps had passed over Colonel Henderson for four years. He is now on a highly selective list of nine colonels to be granted a coveted one star that denotes general rank status Brigadier General. The list was signed by President Biden, and according to the committee's website, it got to the Senate Armed Services Committee Wednesday evening to start the required confirmation process. We're told such promotions wouldn't normally garner much attention, but Colonel Henderson is a black man with combat experience in the Marines, a service that has never had a four-star officer who was not a white man in its 245-year history. Even the one, two, and three-star Marine Corps officer positions are predominantly white and male, particularly the ones in the combat specialties that feed the four-star ranks. If Colonel Henderson is confirmed by the Senate, he will become the rare black general with a shot of getting all the way to the tops. And, you know, the New York Times actually profiled Colonel Henderson last year mm -hmm. in a piece in this piece. They noted he has the military background that the Marine Corps says it prizes in general. Let me break some of that down. Multiple combat tours, leadership experience mm -hmm. and the respect of those he commanded and most who commanded him. There was also a quote about him in there that I found interesting. A former sergeant said, Tony Henderson has done everything you could do in the Marines except get a hand salute from Jesus Christ himself. Mm. Oh. And yet he was still passed over three times. Brooke, three uh, times. Wow. Yeah, ahead, I'm David. sorry. I didn't mean happen before you, Romeo. But um, yes, yeah, so I absolutely read that too. Um, amazing story. Um, I come from a full family of... Air Force, Navy, the whole nine. So um, the first thing that I want to add about this was that I'm hopeful and I'm, you know, optimistic that having the new uh, Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, being a black man, that that might inspire more uh, black people overall to join the Marines. But also, I was reading a story. I did a little dive on this, a deep dive. And so um, I heard that reportedly one thing that held him back was they were saying that his tendency to speak his mind in a culture that praises team players. And so what I got about that was that, you know, when a black man speaks his mind it's aggressive like we say about black women but then i'm sure there are white men that speak their mind in the marines all the time and you know it's not the same treatment so that's kind of what i got from that story for sure too but i'm happy that it's happening yes definitely happy that it's happening look only what 25 african americans in the marines have reached gender in any form 25 25 so this is something that's definitely long overdue i'm happy to see this happening uh can't wait to see what he does when mm -hmm. people talk about you know uh you know a, a lack of understanding about with what systemic racism is this is a prime example yeah. of it. 245 years and no black person has ever gotten to the rank in which he's being nominated for. So, yeah. And like 43 percent of the people that are serving, you know, there are people of color and not very many are in charge at the very, very top as we know that. So that's something that needs to change as well. A lot of work to do in this country. But a lot of work. That. I agree. Absolutely. All right. Well, at least two recent death threats against Congresswoman Maxine Waters are under investigation by Capitol Police detective, detectives, according to CBS News. There has been an increase in menacing calls to Waters' office since January 6th Capitol attack, according to her office. The latest threat was from a Mississippi man who left a message on February 8th that said if he didn't have a child, he would take his, quote, AR and spray Pelosi, you, Swalwell, Sheila Jackson Lee, and on December 15th, a Kansas 
man called and left a racist and profane message that included, I've got an AK-47 and I'll use it if I have to. Now, um, I read the message from the guy in Kansas. It's way too profane for us to even discuss here. It's it's disgusting, as a matter of fact. Now, we all know that Waters is, is one of uh, President Trump's most, or former President Trump's uh, most outspoken critics. Um, and she believes that the threats have persisted since the January 6th insurrection because of the former president's refusal to accept the results of the 2020 election and his ongoing implicit support of domestic terrorists. Um, and, you know, it's really, it's at this point, it's being proven that lawmakers were directly involved um, in and in communication with these rioters you know the only confidence that i have that this case is even going to be handled um with the uh seriousness that it has to is the fact that the capitol police has a black woman as their interim chief chief Pittman, right now so Mm -hmm. that's the only confidence that i have in this um and in addition to this the reason why swalwell was um was uh kind of noted in that um threatened in in addition to uh waters is because um, he's the House impeachment manager and uh, intelligence committee chairman. He's filed a lawsuit as of Friday against Trump, Giuliani, and Rep. Mo Brooks, this, um, claiming that they should be held liable for the injuries and the uh, destruction that took place on January 6th. Yeah, and you wonder how serious should we take these mm-hmm. threats, right? Because you think about in 2019 when a man threatened to hang former President Barack Obama and kill Congresswoman Maxine Waters. I believe he got like four years, but you have to ask yourself, is something like that enough time? Like, are you setting an example for this not to happen? Because we hear about some of these threats, but I'm sure it happens almost on a daily mm-hmm. for those. It January really 6th is enough reason for us to, you know, put a lot of stock into these threats. I mean, these people were stalking um, our, you know, our, our, our representatives in Congress. Like, it's, yeah, absolutely, this should be taken with a, a complete and total um, seriousness. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to add in just really quickly while we're on the topic of Maxine Waters. Um, So she introduced a new bill yesterday called the Workforce Justice Act. And so I think it's really amazing because it's um, going to pretty much help for those who have been incarcerated and they want to reenter the workforce. You take off on the job application. Have you ever had a felony before? So I just really think that's amazing. And it was it was introduced last year by David Trone um, and it didn't go all the way through. So I'm hoping that that uh, goes all the way through because I think that's very important and I would love to see that to mm-hmm. see that happen for sure. We'll definitely yeah. see. Mm-hmm. All right, so mates, UCLA has introduced steps to create a more inclusive environment for black Bruins. Here to discuss a recent <coughs> report on recommendations and implementations as UCLA professional Walter R. Allen. Welcome to the Black Report. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. Happy to be with you. We appreciate We're you joining you. us. So let's talk about Professor, what is the Marino study? Explain that to our soulmates. The Marino study is uh, actually the Marino report. Um, was a result of a very uh, egregious racial um, instance of racial discrimination against a professor, black professor in the School of Medicine. Um, To put it uh, in its its short form, um, his head was photoshopped onto the body of a gorilla and uh, he was, the gorilla was being sodomized by an individual who had a photoshopped head of his boss. And this was published in and presented in a a, a, a department-wide meeting. The uh, offense was settled by the courts to the tune of $4.5 million. Mm-hmm. And it also served as a wake-up call for UCLA uh, that the kinds of issues that you were just discussing are very much alive and, and ill on, on the campus and needed to be addressed. So the senior leadership um, commissioned a Blue Ribbon um, um, Committee to investigate the status of racial discrimination on campus and make recommendations. So that is the Moreno Report. And the full copy of that report is available on the university website uh, at the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. What do you think needs to take place moving forward for UCLA and other PWIs? You know, the lessons are similar to those that were um, implied in your discussion of the situation in the Marine Corps, um, yeah, in terms of just so many areas of, of American mm-hmm. life. Um, racism, particularly anti-Black racism, is just deeply rooted in the culture, in the institutions, the procedures. And so it becomes a challenge of literally just dealing with every aspect of those institutions and with a goal in mind of, of, of just reversing those ten, those, those, those uh, 
deeply seated uh, uh, prejudices and, and, and discriminatory practices. And key to that, of course, is diversifying the individuals who are in those decision making positions. And at the same time, requiring accountability at all levels. Okay, UCLA Professor Allen's joining us here today on Fox News Black Report. How do HBCUs fit into this conversation? HBCUs have been the model from their okay. very, you know, no HBCU, HBCU ever forbade people of different races and cultures from being students. So the lesson that uh, the lessons that, that that predominantly white institutions are looking to learn, they need only turn to the HBCUs because those HBCUs, you look at their faculties, their faculties are diverse. They have diverse student bodies. They have distinguished, they have distinct commitment to uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. That is their, their mantra. That's part of their DNA. And, and in the same way that, unfortunately, the discrimination is part of the D DNA of these predominantly white institutions. So HBCUs are leading the way. And as you know, they, they punch above their weight. They're 3% of all schools in the country and in every year produce 25% of all blacks who graduate with BAs and even higher percentages in terms of the blacks who graduate with masters and, and doctorates and professional degrees. So true. This is something that has been um, a hot debate, I would say. How important to you do you think it is for colleges to change the names of buildings and take down statues of white supremacists? Oh, it's, it's critical. I um, started my career as a, as a young professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, we were, by the way, uh, brought onto the campus under court order, essentially. It was a court settlement. And, and predictably, the year before, the university had not been able to find one qualified black faculty member. After the court settlement, 40 of us started across all the diverse fields, psychiatry, law, sociology. Uh, but I do remember Silent Sam, who was uh, the, the statue in the middle of the campus commemorating a Confederate soldier. And those Confederate soldiers, as you know, were dedicated to the preservation of slavery, and they were treasonous. And so every day when I walked to my office, I had to walk in the shadow of, of, of Silent Sam. Mm. And, you know, I was an older, mature individual, and it still bothered me. So can you, you can imagine how it affected the young, younger black students who were uh, on the campus and in the shadow of, of Silent Sam. And for that matter, how negatively it affected white students' notions of what is appropriate. And, and in terms of racial stereotypes. Mm, that's true. Professor Allen, thank you so much for mm -hmm. joining us today here on Fox News Black Report. You are welcome back anytime and have a great weekend, okay? Thank you, thank you. And I will stay around to see the rest of the show. Thank <laughs> you. I'm sure you know what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so Willie Washington, who was a trailblazer and the first black man in a law enforcement in Putnam County, Florida, he has died at the age of 82. Uh, Washington was also serving on the Wallaca Town Council for decades. In the 1960s, Washington was elected to the town council in Wallaca. He was also not allowed into the town hall to be sworn in because of segregation laws in place at the time. In 1974, he became Putnam County Sheriff and the first black law enforcement officer. And he also served 35 years with the sheriff's office. So, um, of course, uh, this is a very um, light, it's a, it's a sad story to hear, but um, mm -hmm. just there were so many great things um, that were put out about him um, that are great to hear. So um, I was reading that the current Putnam County Sheriff, his name is Homer Gator DeLoach. He said that about Washington, that he will always, he's always made decisions to help others. And he was genuine at a time when he and others in our community were faced with a lot of adversity and he persevered. So I just want to add that in about him. Um, we didn't know him personally, but he sounds like an amazing, an amazing man. Sounded like an amazing man for sure. They, they said he was definitely a trailblazer. And I just can't imagine getting that position and mm -hmm. it can't go inside the building to be sworn in. Mm -hmm. That is now that meeting room is named after him. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. That is great. And may he that's rest a, in peace. That's a fantastic legacy to leave behind. Absolutely. That's true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're going to check in with our soulmates in a little bit. But, oh, sorry, Brooke. Did you have something? I'm sorry. I did. Of course. Of I'm course so I did. It um, brings us back around to the first story, right? Where What your point is, you know, he was doing his job, but then not mm -hmm. able to fully benefit from his job like his colleagues. And it brings us back to our first story and systemic racism. And yeah. you think about the history and all of our members of military who have been black men over the years, right? Black men and black women over the years, some going to war, 
you know, decades ago and not being able to experience the same freedom once they come home yeah. that they were fighting for in another country. Yeah, imagine having to go through that. What goes through their mind? Yeah. Knowing after what you survived and you come back home and you're not even accepted or appreciated. Mm. That's a problem.